chapter 4, beginning of public labors. Up to this time I had never prayed in public and had only spoken a few timid words in prayer meeting. It was now impressed upon me that I should seek God in prayer at our small social meetings. This I dared not do, fearful of becoming confused and failing to express my thoughts. But the duty was impressed upon my mind so forcefully that when I attempted to pray in secret, I seemed to be mocking God because I had failed to obey His will. Despair overwhelmed me, and for three long weeks no ray of light pierced the gloom that encompassed me. My sufferings of mind were intense. Sometimes for a whole night I would not dare to close my eyes, but would wait till my twin sister was fast asleep, then quietly leave my bed and kneel upon the floor, praying silently with a dumb agony that cannot be described. The horrors of an eternally burning hell were ever before me. I knew that it was impossible for me to live long in this state, and I dared not die and meet the terrible fate of the sinner. With what envy did I regard those who realized their acceptance with God? How precious did the Christian's hope seem to my agonized soul! I frequently remained bowed in prayer nearly all night, groaning and trembling with inexpressible anguish and a hopelessness that passes all description. Lord, have mercy was my plea, and like the poor publican I dared not lift my eyes to heaven, but bowed my face upon the floor. I became very much reduced in flesh and strength, yet I kept my suffering and despair to myself. Dream of Temple and Lamb While in this state of despondency I had a dream that made a deep impression upon my mind. I dreamed of seeing a temple to which many persons were flocking. Only those who took refuge in the temple would be saved when time should close and all who remained outside would be forever lost. The multitudes without who were going about their various ways derided and ridiculed those who were entering the temple and told them that this plan of safety was a cunning deception, that in fact there was no danger whatever to avoid. They even laid hold of some to prevent them from hastening within the walls. Fearful of being ridiculed, I thought best to wait until the multitude dispersed or until I could enter unobserved by them. But the numbers increased instead of diminishing, and fearful of being too late, I hastily left my home and pressed through the crowd. In my anxiety to reach the temple, I did not notice or care for the throng that surrounded me. On entering the building, I saw that the vast temple was supported by one immense pillar, and to this was tied a lamb, all mangled and bleeding. We who were present seemed to know that this lamb had been torn and bruised on our account. All who entered the temple must come before it and confess their sins. Just before the lamb were elevated seats, upon which sat a company looking very happy. The light of heaven seemed to shine upon their faces, and they praised God and sang songs of glad thanksgiving that seemed like the music of the angels. These were they who had come before the Lamb, confessed their sins, received pardon, and were now waiting in glad expectation of some joyful event. Even after I had entered the building, a fear came over me and a sense of shame that I must humble myself before these people. But I seemed compelled to move forward and was slowly making my way around the pillar in order to face the Lamb when a trumpet sounded The temple shook, shouts of triumph arose from the assembled saints, an awful brightness illuminated the building, then all was intense darkness. The happy people had all disappeared with the brightness, and I was left alone in the silent horror of the night. I awoke in agony of mind and could hardly convince myself that I had been dreaming. It seemed to me that my doom was fixed, that the Spirit of the Lord had left me never to return." Dream of Seeing Jesus Soon after this I had another dream. It seemed to be, I seemed to be sitting in abject despair with my face in my hands reflecting like this. If Jesus were upon the earth, I would go to him, throw myself at his feet, and tell him all my sufferings. He would not turn away from me. He would have mercy upon me, and I would love and serve him always. Just then the door opened, and a person of beautiful form and countenance entered. He looked upon me pitifully and said, Do you wish to see Jesus? 
He is here, and you can see him if you desire it. Take everything you possess and follow me. I heard this with unmistakable joy and gladly gathered up all my little possessions, every treasured trinket, and followed my guide. He led me to a steep and apparently frail stairway. As I began to ascend the steps, he cautioned me to keep my eyes fixed upward, lest I should grow dizzy and fall. Many others who were climbing the steep ascent fell before gaining the top. Finally, we reached the last step and stood before a door. Here my guide directed me to leave all the things that I had brought with me. I cheerfully laid them down. He then opened the door and bade me, to en- bade me enter. In a moment, I stood before Jesus. There was no mistaking that beautiful countenance. That expression of benevolence and majesty could belong to no other. As his gaze rested upon me, I knew at once that he was acquainted with every circumstance of my life and all my inner thoughts and feelings. I tried to shield myself from his gaze, feeling unable to bear endure his searching eyes. But he drew near with a smile, and laying his hand upon my head, said, Fear not. The sound of his sweet voice thrilled my heart with a happiness it had never before experienced. I was too joyful to utter a word, but overcome with emotion, sank prostrate at his feet. While I was lying helpless there, Scenes of beauty and glory passed before me, and I seemed to have reached the safety and peace of heaven. At length my strength returned, and I arose. The loving eyes of Jesus were still upon me, and his smile filled my soul with gladness. His presence awoke in me a holy reverence and an inexpressible love. My guide now opened the door, and we both passed out. He bade me take up again all the things I had left without. This done, he handed me a green cord coiled up closely. This he directed me to place next to my heart, and when I wished to see Jesus, to take it from my bosom and stretch it to the utmost. He cautioned me not to let it remain coiled for any length of time, lest it should become knotted and difficult to straighten. I placed the cord near my heart and joyfully descended the narrow stairs, praising the Lord and telling all whom I met where they could find Jesus. This dream gave me hope. The green cord represented faith to my mind, and the beauty and simplicity of trusting in God began to dawn upon my soul. Friendly Sympathy and Counsel I now confided all my sorrows and perplexities to my mother. She tenderly sympathized with and encouraged me, advising me to go for counsel to Elder Stockman, who then preached the Advent Doctrine in Portland. I had great confidence in him, for he was a devoted servant of Christ. Upon hearing my story, he placed his hand affectionately upon my head, saying with tears in his eyes, Ellen, you are only a child. Yours is a most singular experience for one of your tender age. Jesus must be preparing you for some special work. He then told me that even if I were a person of mature years, and thus harassed by doubt and despair, he would tell me that he knew there was hope for me through the love of Jesus. The very agony of mind I had suffered was positive evidence that the Spirit of the Lord was striving with me. He said that when the sinner becomes hardened in guilt, he does not realize the enormity of his transgression, but flatters himself that he is about right and in no particular danger. The Spirit of the Lord leaves him, and he becomes careless and indifferent or recklessly defiant. This good man told me of the love of God for his erring children, that instead of rejoicing in their destruction, he longed to draw them to himself in simple faith and trust. He dwelled upon the great love of Christ and the plan of redemption. Elder Stockman spoke of my early misfortune and said it was indeed a grievous affliction, but he made me believe that the hand of a loving father had not been withdrawn from me and that in the future life, when the mist that then darkened my mind had vanished, I would discern the wisdom of the providence which had seemed so cruel and mysterious. Jesus said to his disciples, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. John 13:7. In the great future we should no longer see as through a glass darkly, but come face to face with the mysteries of divine love. Go free, Ellen, and return to your home. Trusting in Jesus, for he will not withhold his love from any true seeker. 
He then prayed earnestly for me, and it seemed that God would certainly regard the prayer of his saint, even if my humble petitions were unheard. My mind was much relieved, and the wretched slavery of doubt and fear departed as I listened to the wise and tender counsel of this teacher in Israel. I left his presence comforted and encouraged. During the few minutes in which I received instruction from Elder Stockman, I had obtained more knowledge on the subject of God's love and pitying tenderness than from all the sermons and exhortations to which I had ever listened. My first public prayer. I returned home and went again went before the Lord, promising to do and suffer anything He might require of me, if only the smiles of Jesus might cheer my heart. The same duty was again presented to me that had troubled my mind before to take up my cross among the assembled people of God. An opportunity was not long wanting. There was a prayer meeting that evening at my uncle's which I attended. As others knelt for prayer, I bowed with them, trembling, and after a few had prayed, my voice arose in prayer before I was aware of it. In that moment, the promises of God appeared to me like so many precious pearls that were to be received only for the asking. As I prayed, the burden and agony of soul that I had so long endured left me, and the blessing of the Lord descended on me like the gentle dew. I praised God from the depths of my heart. Everything seemed shut out from me but Jesus and His glory, and I lost consciousness of what was passing around me. The Spirit of God rested upon me with such power that I was unable to go home that night. When I awakened to realization, I found myself cared for in the house of my uncle, where we had assembled for the prayer meeting. Neither my uncle or my aunt enjoyed religion, although the former had once made a profession but had since backslidden. I was told that he had been greatly disturbed while the power of God rested upon me in so special a manner and had walked the floor sorely troubled and distressed in his mind. When I was first struck down, some of those present were greatly alarmed and were about to run for a physician thinking some sudden and dangerous indisposition had attacked me. But my mother bade them let me alone, for it was plain to her and to the other experienced Christians that it was the wondrous power of God that had prostrated me. When I did return home on the following day, a great change had taken place in my mind. It seemed to me that I could hardly be the same person that left my father's house the previous evening. This passage was continually in my thoughts. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23, 1. My heart was full of happiness as I softly repeated these words. A view of the Father's love. Faith now took possession of my heart. I felt an inexpressible love for God and had the witness of His Spirit that my sins were pardoned. My views of the Father were changed. I now looked upon him as a tender and kind parent rather than a stern tyrant compelling men to blind obedience. My heart went out toward him in a deep and fervent love. Obedience to his will seemed a joy. It was a pleasure to be in his service. No shadow clouded the light that revealed to me the perfect will of God. I felt the assurance of an indwelling Savior and realized the truth of what Christ had said. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8, 12 My peace and happiness were in such marked contrast with my former gloom and anguish that it seemed to me that as if I had been rescued from hell and transported to heaven. I could even praise God for the misfortune that had been the trial of my life, for it had been been the means of fixing my thoughts upon eternity. Naturally proud and ambitious, I might not have been inclined to give my heart to Jesus had it not been for the sore affliction that had cut me off in a manner from the triumphs and vanities of the world. For six months not a shadow clouded my mind, nor did I neglect one known duty. My whole endeavor was to do the will of God and keep Jesus in heaven continually in mind. I was surprised. and enraptured with the clear views now presented to me of the atonement and of the work of Christ. I will not attempt to further explain the exercises of my mind 
suffice it to say that old things had passed away, all things had become new. There was not a cloud to mar my perfect bliss. I longed to tell the story of Jesus' love, but felt no disposition to engage in common conversation with anyone. My heart was so filled with love to God and the peace that passeth understanding that I loved to meditate and pray. Bearing testimony, the night after receiving so great a blessing, I attended the Advent meeting. When the time came for the followers of Christ to speak in His favor, I could not remain silent but rose and related my experience. Not a thought had entered my mind of what I should say but the simple story of Jesus' love to me fell from my lips with perfect freedom, and my heart was so happy to be liberated from its bondage of dark despair that I lost sight of the people about me and seemed to be alone with God. I found no difficulty in expressing my peace and happiness except for the tears of gratitude that choked my utterance. Elder Stockman was present. He had recently seen me in deep despair. And as he now saw my captivity turned, he wept aloud, rejoicing with me and praising God for his proof of his tender mercy and loving kindness. Not long after receiving this great blessing, I attended a conference meeting at the Christian church where Elder Brown was pastor. I was invited to relate my experience and felt not only great freedom of expression but happiness in telling my simple story of the love of Jesus and of the joy of being accepted of God. As I spoke with subdued heart and tearful eyes, my soul seemed drawn toward heaven in thanksgiving. The melting power of the Lord came upon the assembled people. Many were weeping and others praising God. Sinners were invited to rise for prayers, and many responded to the call. My heart was so thankful to God for the blessing He had given me that I longed to have others participate in this sacred joy. My mind was deeply interested for those who might be suffering under a sense of the Lord's displeasure and the burden of sin. While relating my experience, I felt that no one could resist the evidence of God's pardoning love that had wrought so wonderful a change in me. The reality of true conversion seemed so plain to me that I felt like helping my young friends into the light, and at every opportunity exerted my influence toward this end. Laboring for Young Friends I arranged meetings with my older friends, some of whom were considerably older than myself, and a few were married persons. A number of of them were vain and thoughtless. My experience sounded to them like an idle tale, and they did not heed my entreaties. But I determined that my efforts should never cease till these dear friends, for whom I had so great an interest, yielded to God. Several entire nights were spent by me in earnest prayer for those whom I had sought out, and brought together for the purpose of laboring and praying with them. Some of these had met with us from curiosity to hear what I had to say. Others thought me beside myself to be so persistent in my efforts, especially when they manifested no concern on their own part. At every one of our little meetings I continued to exhort and pray for each one separately until every one had yielded to Jesus, acknowledging the merits of His pardoning love. Every one was converted to God. Night after night in my dreams I seemed to be laboring for the salvation of souls. At such times special cases were presented to my mind. These I afterwards sought out and prayed with. In every instance but one these persons yielded themselves to the Lord. Some of our more formal brethren feared that I was too zealous for the conversion of souls. But time seemed to me so short that it behooved all who had a hope of a blessed immortality and looked for the soon coming of Christ to labor without ceasing for those who were still in their sins and standing on the awful brink of ruin. Though I was very young, the plan of salvation was so clear to my mind and my personal experience had been so marked that upon considering the matter I knew it was my duty to continue my efforts for the salvation of precious souls and to pray and confess Christ at every opportunity. My entire being was offered to the service of my Master. Let come what would, I determined to please God and live as one who expected the Savior to come and reward the faithful. I felt like a little child coming to God as to my Father and asking Him what He would have me to do. 
Then as my duty was made plain to me, it was my greatest happiness to perform it. Peculiar trials sometimes beset me. Those older in experience than myself endeavored to hold me back and cool the ardor of my faith. But with the smiles of Jesus brightening my life and the love of God in my heart, I went on my way with a joyful spirit. 